this just in, the highly anticipated conference, Business Analysis Summit Southern Africa, will be hosted in Durban. The 12th edition of the conference will see the best minds in business analysis, both locally and internationally, descend on the sunny shores between the 4th and the 6th of November. This is a developing story so keep your eye out for further information. Make sure you don't miss out on the business analysis event of the year. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our tools and techniques. Um, I hope you had a wonderful day. Let me start sharing. Okay, so this is our tools and techniques evening. We're nearing the end of the of the year, so um, yeah, we've got some exciting events coming up. So tonight we have designing data products to support the customer value proposition, a CDO guide, and how a diesel is going to present that for us. Um, just to go through some of our house rules, okay? Please mute yourself um, unless clear to talk. We're going to gather all the questions in the chat and then we'll open it up for discussion a little bit later once Howard has finished his presentation. You can switch off your videos. Um, the presenter's video is loud. Presentation will be around 40 to 45 minutes. We'll allow for Q&A and then um, yeah, Howard is on his way back to Cape Town. So if anything after that, we'll manage those questions. You can post it all in our chat and in the Q&A section. There's some valuable links that we're going to share with you. Uh, Liana will paste that in the chat for us. There's YouTube. Unfortunately, we don't share this presentation, but we do upload it onto YouTube, and you can get hold of that in about a week's time. Then as well, we've got our business analysis membership. If you really want to be part of this community, you can sign up at that link, um, get some more information there. Please go to our LinkedIn page and go see what's happening in the IIBA South Africa chapter. There's lots of interesting developments and especially our BA Summit up and coming. Um, we're going to share some of those links in the chat with you as well. So please go and visit our LinkedIn pages, go share. Um, we really want you all at the summit this year. And then if you're interested in joining or presenting at the Tools and Techniques evening, please um, email our professional development at irba.org. All right. Well, let's get into it. Okay. So we've got Howard Diesel here tonight, um, certified data management professional with a specialization in information governance and advisory services. Okay. He's got a career spanning over three decades. Howard has been instrumental in helping organizations establish effective information management programs those that deliver tangible business value. His approach ensures that only the necessary information management capabilities are implemented to address current challenges. Okay. Howard's career began 1986 as a database administrator. He's since gained extensive experience across all information knowledge areas defined in the DMBOC. Familiar with that, we have our BA BOC. So that's the data management book of knowledge. He has now low focused his expertise on information governance, ensuring that businesses are all about doing the right thing and establishing appropriate information capabilities. Right, so over to Howard. Thank you, Christiana. So let me just share my screen. Okay, great. My screen. Yes, we can, Howard. Fantastic. Okay, so 
this is the technique that we started to put together to help customers design data products. Uh, um, the data product should be considered to be similar to that of a business product. Some cases, the data products will earn money directly. In other cases, those data products will be embedded into business products where appropriate to get more value out. And in other cases, they need really just products for internal stakeholders. And so we have to know exactly who we're building these data products for and, and what their challenges are. And that's what this chat is tonight. All right, so this deck comes from basically a four week series where we provide the essential concepts around a value proposition. And yes, that starts off with the data, with the business model. But then there's another click into that customer or the customer profile. And we get a little bit more details coming out of that. And typically, what we do, we talk to uh, data professionals data citizens in terms of how they should interact with a value proposition and then uh, of course the the cdo and today i'm going to be taking you through the cdo discussion as they typically have to sell this approach to to the other business people the other executives and they have to show them how we're going to derive value from data attended a fantastic conference this week and everyone was talking about the cost of cloud and the cost of all of these things. And someone made an amazing point. He said, uh, if you talk about, if you keep on talking about the cost, you, you're never going to win uh, the discussion because cloud is costly. But if you talk about the value that you're generating using the cloud, then the discussion changes. So, that's what I'd like to encourage all of us to do is to, how do we talk about the value of what we're doing and the value proposition for the organization? Okay, so let's get to some fundamentals in terms of what is a data value proposition? Well, data value proposition is, is basically a promise of value and that is the value to be delivered, the value that we need to communicate and probably most important for the CDO is the value to be acknowledged that the data office is actually delivering some value. And, and I find that's the area that so many of us miss out is, is agreeing with the business before you get involved in all these fancy developments as to, well, how will you acknowledge the value that I delivered? This comes to this point of, if we don't explicitly state it, and, and say, this is how we're going to account for it. And we get all sorts of implicit interpretations of the stakeholders. And each stakeholder has a different set of needs and pains and gains and may interpret the value differently. So always try to help with the, the governance people is to say, don't think that you can discuss value after you've delivered it. You need to discuss the commercial feasibility before you start getting involved with it. And it's a fantastic way to prioritize the initiatives that the data management program is going to deal with. Now, as you can see, and I'm and I was checking to Christiana to say, there is the, the business mode. You can see it's the canvas over here. And we want to double click into those two white areas to give us the value proposition. And where you should be starting is in this area over here where you have the customer jobs what needs to be done okay and then what are the pains on doing that work and what are the gains and you should be spending lots of time in these three areas even before you decide on what product is going to be used to address these pains and gains and jobs so you don't want to build this one first before you understand this value proposition and and it's so helpful to understand the pains and the gains to know that my product has got the right pain relievers to address the pains and the right gain creators to address the gains so these are important matches that you need to be able to and they call it the fit the the customer fit to ensure that that's correct okay so 
how do we address these biggest challenges that we face? Uh, first of all, this value proposition should be in the forefront of our data strategy. Uh, it should be in the forefront of the business strategy. You know, how are we going to deliver value to our customers? And we need to be able to emphasize this at every opportunity we get, that this is how we deliver value. This is how we deliver you value for whichever stakeholder you are, every from in everyone from HR to marketing to uh, customer engagement. It doesn't matter who you are, we need to be able to emphasize how we deliver value to them. And more importantly, each, every individual, every member of the team must be aware of this is how we're producing value so that when they are asked, they can reiterate it and they can explain it without bumbling around and trying to find the right words and, and, and areas like that. They should they should understand it and we should train them in being able to articulate value. And this helps us create this common ground. Sorry. It's, it's the common ground that we need with our stakeholders. It's so much nicer to have a value discussion with them than to have a, oh, how much is this going to cost me? And am I going to be able to deliver what you need? And is it going to be cost effective? Th those are difficult discussions. Whereas if we talk about the benefit and the value we can deliver, it's sort of up to them to make the decision of, well, are they going to pay for this product? And it's, it's a similar problem we have when we're looking for a product to do certain work for us or certain jobs for us. We would look at what the issues are it's going to address. And if those issues are significant enough, we say, well, that cost is appropriate. Okay. So we need to understand the persona demographics and and understand what they need, what their challenges are. Okay. And we use the value proposition to evaluate and drive the data management operating. Okay, so depending on what you require, then it may need all these roles and responsibilities. If you if you want like a Spotify hyper personalization, well then I gotta have the right people to be able to deliver that value proposition to you. And that's that's quite important before you start getting into all the appropriate governance and funding and architectures is do we agree on the value that we, we deliver? Okay. Now, interestingly enough, Gartner has created these three value propositions for data and analytics, and they've classified them into a utility value proposition. And it goes like, our data and analytics should be instantly available to all for all purposes, like a utility, water, energy, whatever it is that should be on tap, and we get it whenever we need it. And then we've got the enabler, that with data and analytics, we enable the business to make the right decisions. And that's really the one that, that I like. Um, and I feel that that enabler becomes comes for when you get the trust then you can operate into the driver where you drive business and you innovate. So you first of all got to get the ticket to the table to make sure that they're comfortable with you and they trust you. And then you can start driving change or driving new ways of doing things. But it's important to establish that credibility that you can deliver value. Okay. So certainly, and this is the utility value proposition that Gartner have defined. Uh, we believe that data and analytics offers the most value uh, for you as a generic platform. So there's no specifics. We're going to give you as much data as possible. And we will promise you that whenever you need new data, we will get it there as quickly as possible. And so we then ensure that the platform is always available. It's on continuously. And we will continue to add further data sources as you need more insights. We'll then go and find the data and add it to you. Okay. And your bottom line value proposition is if the data isn't there today, it will be tomorrow. Okay. That's not an <laughs> that's not an easy value proposition. It takes some time to analyze that. But that's the type of offering we can make as CDOs to our organization. What sort of success measure, measures will you use for a utility? Availability quick and easy access. And then it's this important one here is, how long does it take me to add a new data source? Okay. 
So they wanted today they recognize the problem. Tomorrow they've got the data available. Okay. So it's a little bit hard when you need to go and find it outside of your organization. If it's internal, yeah, that's a different purpose matter, but external data can be quite a bit harder. Now we go on to the enabler. Okay, and I, I like this one. So it's a special business goal, a specific business goal. From your data, from your business architecture, you know what the goals are and what the value proposition at the business architecture level is. And we have to deliver solutions that meet that business value proposition. It needs to be spot on. It can't be left or right of it. It's got to address the jobs that need to be done, the pains and the gains. Okay, so that requires that I understand the business. And we certainly make use of our business analysts to define what it is, our business architects to understand the capabilities, the structure. Um, and then we need to provide a fit for purpose business solution. Okay. Now that fit for purpose is, is not as easy as we think it is because different departments, different stakeholders require the data product for a different decision making process. And do you understand that or it's, a, it's quite a detailed process you should go through to understand that purpose? So we commit to concrete business improvement, concrete value delivery. And you can almost estimate the value that you've been able before doing the work. And that's why I like to discuss the value proposition for doing it. So what sort of examples do we have? Conversion rate movement in marketing campaigns, cost reduction, automated, uh, predicting predictive asset management through IoT and analytics, or money saving, improved fraud detection. So we get told what that issue is that they're facing, and we deliver exactly what they require. Okay. Now, my value proposition is in, in this situation is I will help you achieve the business goals with new insights, new data, new business questions, I'll, I'll help you achieve it. And then we drive the innovation with new business ideas and revenue sources. And we have to constantly look at the latest technologies, the techniques, and the data that we require to deliver that. Okay, success measures. Uh, how long does the discovery exercise take you to execute? From talking to a person to being able to deliver it, optimize, and then transformation. And we apply this 50, 40, 10 process to go through. New revenue, how do we able to deliver new ever revenue? And then we have this continuous discovery exercises, not just a once off, what's the follow up? So when you deliver value here, you'll see, ah, but there's new value down there. And so the business keeps on coming back to us for more and more of these discovery exercises. That's when we recognize that we're doing a good job. Um, now, we've, so we've got these different value propositions. And what Gartner states is they can exist simultaneously. I, I find that a bit hard because that utility one, it's, it's about speed of engineering. And the business one is about being able to understand the business requirements properly and then find the right data. Yeah. Um, but I do feel that if you're understanding the business right, then you can help them transform the business. So I, I think certain ones can work simultaneously, and I'm not convinced that it will do. Right. Now, the important thing for us as data people is when we build the product, and I'm sure business professional, business analysts do that as well, the product managers, is how do we communicate the value that we are going to deliver? So I use this process. It's called define, validate, and communicate. And this is an example of a define. Um, so when I talk to executives to give them advice, I basically say, and I use this as within the data management community, we analyze executives and say, as a CDO, what are the most important jobs that you have? Well, typically they say, I have to deliver a data strategy. I have to build an effective data operating model. I have to ensure that we mature and we have principles, policies, procedures. I've got to give actionable insights. 
I've got to change the culture, change, and then I've got to ensure, ensure levels of risk management. And for each one of these functional jobs, I then ask them about what's your importance? What do you, what do you, how, how do you rank your importance? And then is the pain and gain tangible? Can you feel the pain and gain? Then am I missing anything? When you're unsatisfied, I haven't dealt with everything. And lucrative means this is of good value to us. And what was fascinating, sorry, when we spoke about this is initially I thought, wow, everybody is, is going to go for the data strategy. Now, I must admit, I was interviewing a lot of financial service CDOs, and their challenge was risk management. And you can see this is where the most important thing to them was dealing with risk, that BCBS 239, the radar. And and it completely surprised me. And I, it, it was good feedback to me to say, all right, you keep on talking to the CDOs about strategy, but most of the times they were about risk. And so the red ones are telling me where the big challenges are. Okay, so they want risk and they want insights. And then this was a very interesting discussion when we start talking about emotions or what are the emotional stresses of that they have to face. And they constantly have a challenge of making sure that data is trustworthy and they're always facing data quality issues. And then the other one that they have is what they call external assurance. So are they going to be able to have external parties come in and assure that they can to succeed? Now, if you fail the emotional side, typically this has social consequences. Okay, so I can lose credibility or impact if I don't deliver what the business requires. And I say, oh, that's what I'm going to deliver in the value proposition. Well, I'm starting to suffer a business credibility issue. That's what happens when you can see those CDO 10 years of only 2.4 years compared to a CEO or a CIO, which is 10 and 8 years like that. CDOs are, are battling with credibility. Industry impact. If, if, you, if you are not looking after your data and you're producing bad data, the industry quickly picks up on that. And then being able to develop community trust. Now, I think we're all starting to get this understanding that the more the community trusts us, the more data they give us. If they don't trust us, then they will hide or they'll give us wrong telephone numbers or they'll do all sorts of stuff to confuse us. So we need to, first of all, confirm our understanding. So how do we go about this process? Well, we start off with customer interviews. We show them what it is that we, we think they need to do. Uh, and then we confirm and, prior and prioritize the jobs to be done. We focus on understanding their pain points. And then we would look at how does our data product address those pain points. Constantly have these surveys and polls to collect quantitative data on the customer. There's the preference. What are the perceptions? How do they perceive us? And identify trends of improvement areas. And then use the use the approach of A-B testing. Is this data with these minimal bioproducts better than that? How does that link to our value proposition? Do we have different products that connect to the customer value proposition that we can take that to the bank? We can actually go to a, a bank value that we generate revenue. And then what you want to do then is to run pilot programs on this to say, okay, Let's take one or two people that we feel are what we call early evangelists, and let's test our value proposition on them. Are they uh, responding as we thought? Are we addressing their pains? Are we giving them the gain? So that's uh, an important thing on validation. And if you're not, you're going to have to come back and make representative adjustments. Okay. And then communicating it. Uh, it's always valuable to understand exactly the same way as marketing people break down their customers by understanding the personas. What sort of person are we dealing with? What are their needs? Are they executives that need to make a strategic decision, high value decisions? Or are they people on the shop floor that to make quick, instant decisions? So who are we dealing with and what type of product 
Let's need to look at the requirements. A clear message that will establish the common ground, ensure that it's simple, not going to shoot the lights out and, and spend 20 weeks, even longer developing it. It's got to come through a lot quicker. And then, of course, when you when you have a success, it's about storytelling. How did we achieve it? Is the case studies show the people what we are capable of doing to then gain more subsequent discoveries? Okay, consistent message depends on the channel. Who you talking to? And depends on the persona. You have to talk to the persona in the language that they understand. You have to do visualizations that they understand. Make sure that people are aligned. Gauge a team and then test and optimize in delivering that. Okay, now this data value proposition is something that I've been working on for a while. And I've, for me, I've had to learn three of the areas. First of all, it's business architecture. Secondly, it's marketing. How do the marketing people deal with these value propositions by persona? How do they make sure that they're reaching the pains and the gains? And then there's certainly a skill that the data people don't really have. And that's what we refer to as data value realization. Some people call it monetization. I like to steer away from that because then it's about, everyone thinks it's about selling data. It's about making money. And that's not the only way in which we can deliver value. So we have to learn its different skills. And then what is important for us to keep these three areas working is, well, what is the value proposition, the way that business architecture see it? That's referred to as the value stream, the value proposition, and then the value items. So every single stage within a value proposition must deliver value item that rolls up into the value proposition. But get the value proposition right first before you break it down. Jobs to be done. That's my functional, emotional, and social that we've spoken about. How do I segment? How do I understand the environment, the market, and the customer? How do I segment the stakeholders within my own business? The personas, stakeholders versus customers, and then the product life cycle. How do we build a feature, minimal viable product, add new features as we go, and what is it linked to that customer profile. And these are the types of things that I've had to ensure that I get right uh, between my business architecture, my data value architect, the person that's constantly looking at how do we deliver value, and then the marketing approach. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's something called ProgBoc. That's you know, the product management, product marketing, uh, and that's a valuable uh, be a, a box to have and to work through. And, and we need to learn how to do things like customer journey maps, like life science, jobs to be done, things like persona definitions, customer segmentation, how do you do all of this stuff? Take some, I found it's actually taking me a while. It's taken me three or four months to learn how to do a proper uh, deliverable that in the same way that the marketing people do. So, so to maybe just give you a simple example, here is a value stream as our business architects would, de would define it. At the high level, there's your value stream sitting there and it's acquire alone. But the first step you should ask is, well, what are we trying to achieve when we acquire alone? And that's empowering somebody's financial future. People need loans to maybe invest in something, to go and do some studies, whatever it is, and that's that's the value proposition. It should not be about well, making money out of people and getting the highest return for my, my capital that I provide them. So we've got the value proposition, the value stream, and then the capability map that is used to deliver the value stream. So always what I think about it, understand my persona, I then understand what I'm promising that customer. And then I look at what do we need to be able to do to be able to deliver it on. And here we can see those capabilities. And I start to map data products 
per value item stage within my value stream. And then at the capability level, that's when I start discussing the jobs to be done. So every capability has a set of functional requirements. And to do those functional requirements, I need a data asset. I call those data assets. So I differentiate between a data asset and a data product that the customers see. A data asset is something I need to fulfill a different capability. Okay. Uh, how do I map jobs to be done to my business architecture? There's business capabilities, level one, two, three, and N, uh, to business processes, those front stage business processes. Marketing, I map it to customer segment, customer profile, functional jobs to be done, emotional and social, and then the points, customer journey. And the data value architect will bring in the data products and the data assets. Those are the things that they need to focus on. Now, what we are seeing is that marketing is starting to recognize that, yes, these personas were great at some point. That helps me to do the selective targeting. Um, but, it's, but sometimes that's over-genericizing. Okay. So typically, that's an area where we deliver the customer persona, but we need to go further. We need to go down to personalizing it to a specific customer, not just a level persona. We need to take these offers a lot lower. Can you see there it is an understanding, not at a segment level, okay, but at an individual level. What sort of service we need to be able to predict what the customer needs to deliver what they want. And we're looking at individual customer outcomes. Okay. So personas are great and it's a good starting point, but it's not your end goal. Your end goal is trying to ensure that you deliver value for every single individual. What sort of skills do you need? Um, well, first of all, you've got to have that business architect that's going to build up the business strategy, the value stream, the capabilities. We also then need the marketing architect to help us with brand, customer journey, creative communication. If you don't have a marketing person, you're probably going to have to learn how to do this yourself. Those are the skills. Okay. Uh, what about the data value architect? What are the skills required for a data architect? First of all, to know how to discuss business, uh, how to how to communicate the value to the business. Um, know how to talk about marketing, customer journey. Know how to talk about financial ratios, financial ROIs. Of course, they're going to have analytical skills to measure the feasibility and whether we're doing the right thing. Communication, collaboration and data management. So really important that you know the skills that you need to be able to deliver these value propositions. And you need to be able to be aligned with the business architect. Okay. Um, so the next step is really just understanding this jobs to be done theory. Okay. So people are talking about it in terms of the CX experience. How do we engage with them and the first thing is understanding that customers don't just buy a product they, and they hire a product to do a job so it's help me to do this work help me to automate this help me to avoid whatever it may be I don't need to fall into that trap then warn me when i'm getting there or i need to do this and so can you see that we, we should be changing some of our language to communicate with them and understand the work that they need to be done and how we can create a product that's going to do the work for them. Okay. And again, these are the types of, of jobs. First of all, the functional. So it's the practical things that they need to do. Address the emotional issues. Don't think that you can just do functional and everything's fine. Uh, during the process of building it, they're going to have anxiety. They're going to have, are we able to deliver it? Do I have the right people? Do I have the right technology? And so we're always going to be sitting with anxiety and fear 
don't underestimate that. And then, well, what happens when we fail? Okay, how do we how do we deal with that? So if we if we fail on helping the, the customer do a job, how do we deal with some of the positive and negative consequences of this? Sometimes you might fail. Sometimes I won't do much about the failure. And and you now need to give them techniques on, on dealing with it. Okay. So just some examples of jobs to be done. So if you look at Zoom, uh, the functionality is connect remote workers. Emotional issues are, are unable to see everybody, unable to talk to certain people, unable to manage the crowd. And the social gain you get out of it is being engaged. But we also know that the negative side on this is Sometimes we just see the people's face and not the body language. So we miss out certain aspects of that remote working. We miss out uh, picking up where they're negative or positive when their screens are off, their cameras are off. I, I can't see how you're feeling about this talk. So maybe you think, oh, geez, how it's droning on and it's not really answering my questions or helping me. And those are the social issues that we can have. Whereas if I'm face-to-face, -face, I can pick up what someone's not happy and I can say, well, what am I doing wrong? Well, how do I fix this? PayPal, another example. Functionally, we, we need a secure way to make the payments. Emotional. Um, dealing with issues of carrying cash and check around, I can use PayPal to do it. And social, I've got to have that trust and security that we're going to deliver correctly. Uh, another one is, is marketing campaign. Uh, the biggest challenge with marketing conversion rates is individualized value proposition. Do I believe that you are going to give me value for money? How do I, how do I talk to our diesel or Cristiano? Uh, not talk to Joseph, pregnant mom of five. <laughs> I, 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 I got to understand you a bit better. And that's what causes the challenge of the conversion. What stops you from buying? So functionally, I have to personalize. I have to understand your needs. I have to know what your needs are. I have to understand your behavior. And to do that, I have to segment my customers. I have to personalize content. And I have to automate some of these things because I've got hundreds of thousands of customers. I don't want to uh, personalize for every single customer. I can't do it manually. Emotional pain, wasting time, wasting money. So you can see all of these things now. Here are some really amazing success stories in hyper personalization. Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, Spotify. They, they, they are the ones that are breaking the mold. Netflix brought down blockbusters. Uh, they're able to understand your trends and what you like in terms of videos and suggest new ones. And they keep you coming back. They keep you engaging. And then I can saw these increased engagements, higher conversion rates, and customer loyalty. So they keep you coming back to that scenario. Okay, so just the techniques of, of understanding the segment, breaking it up into personas, jobs to be done, and then building a data product that's going to help you deliver that value proposition. So what's the MVP? Is this data product helping you analyze whatever it is you need and create the gains and take away the pain on doing that? That's the important part. And here you can see is I, I like to stick with this customer profile for a long time until I understand all of the details. And then saying, I can't deliver these ones that I've got crosses on. I can't deliver it and, and I'm not going to worry about it now. And then these are the ones that I am going to worry about. And once you've got that right, step one, now you can start finding a product that's going to meet these requirements. And it takes quite some time to, to do that matching. All right. Um, customer journey is also important. What is the journey that they walk through when they engage with Demo or IIBA in terms of professional? Uh, how do I achieve professional certification? Um, there's a brand and they're going to engage with it and you need to know how they're going to engage and where are they important. 
so that you can build loyalty and you keep them coming back to you know, the different meetings. So there's a brand customer journey and then there's a maturity of customer journey. There is things like career development. I know I take you from a student to a thought leader, go from a student to become a professional, to become a specialist, to become a thought leader. I've got to sh show you the journey that you're working on. Oh, these are the generic steps for a brand. Uh, it may be IIBA, it may be DAMA, whatever it is. First of all, I've got to make you aware. And then I've got to get you to consider the different options, make a decision, and then keep you. And then I've got to not just have retention, but I've got to get to a point where you are bringing other people to the party. So that's what we mean by advocacy. And this is a journey that we've done for Dana, where we bring the people through. We use SFIA levels to allow you to grow, to charge more money, and, and develop across the different areas. So that's an example of a journey map for a profession. I'm not sure what yours looks like. This is the one we use. Um, now, interestingly enough, there's also a journey for data. Data has a journey of infinite data and information, knowledge and wisdom. Data analytics is a journey. Descriptive analysis, predictive, prescriptive, and then cognitive analysis. So these are the things that we answer more questions, and you have a very different engagement model to answer those different questions. And a little bit of what this whole process looks like. BI looks behind you, data science looks forward and answers more and more questions to give you the value that you need. All right, so this is just a playbook on how to create it. I don't think we need to go through all of those levels, but this is so important that we do the right analytics to understand exactly where you are and how we're going to get you to move along the journey. If we don't measure where you are, you can get left, left behind. You, after a while, you say, well, I don't see any value in this. Okay. So let me just show you some quick real-world studies in terms of I'm going to just take you through case uh, to Spotify. Um, but here is a high-level set of value propositions. Netflix, personalized entertainment recommendations in terms of video. Spotify, new music that you'll love. LinkedIn. Connect with professionals and discover career opportunities. So each one of these people have got a value proposition and they work and they drive that value proposition hard and they're all driving it in terms of data. Okay. So these are data value propositions, examples. Spotify, how does Spotify do it? They've got this hyper-personalization at scale. They can personalize every single thing from the types of music you like, to the times, to the, the state of the year, summer, winter, whatever it is, and, and they personalize in everything. So that's, that's Spotify, I hope. Now, let's just do a quick comparison between Spotify and Netflix. Okay. Movies, 158 million. Music, 230 million. Content volume, 5,800. 50 million tracks and podcasts. So can you see the, the scale that, that Spotify is operating compared to what Netflix is operating at? Um, and because the content is so small, they've got to be constantly recommending what's the new song, what should we play next? So they, they are operating at a very different scale to Netflix. Now, the most amazing thing is that to do all of this and to encourage more people to come, They've actually got to automate their marketing campaigns. And it's very specific to the region that you're in. So if you're in Saudi Arabia, okay, you want to be focusing on Arabic music and what's appropriate within your culture. You may not be too interested in South African music. Okay. And maybe vice versa. When I go to Saudi Arabia, then I get all of these prompts about the, the Arabic music. And for a while, it's nice to listen to, but after a while, let me go back to things that happen inside. Okay. Now, what we've seen is the benefits that they have derived. Okay. So stream contribution, 30% of users stream from AI and AI recommended songs. So 30% of the people are using the, the personalization in, in recommendation. Marketing share, 
personalized experience that captured 1.5 times more than Apple and all the other different music areas. So they really do well in what they've got and then user interaction. So with Spotify, they get people to engage with their platform 61 times per month and Apple has only gotten 12 times per month. So we can see the benefit that they're getting out of this amazing personalization. Okay. Now, just to bring you back to, to how would that apply to data? Well, what are the future trends in terms of this hyper personalization? Um, and, and we would choose one of these uh, value propositions from Google. And I did some research on now our ability to build data products. So a lot of these large language models and generative AI, they are able to automate the building and the business people will specify what it is that you require and they will go and build your data product with AI, according to the requirements of the individual. Okay. And then you have this acquisition system where you ingest one of these, the data that you require, you rank the content, and then you deploy it. So what we're trying to say is we should be able to, at some stage, be able to build a data product for all of our stakeholders within our organization. If we are able to reach the levels that people like Spotify do and to take some of these benefits of data products, we are then able to basically automate the personalized data products for all of the different stakeholders from HR. And then we can get back to this utility thing that Gartner is talking about. And I think I feel we've a long way to go. And it's going to take us some time to get there. But the signs are there. People are starting to talk about it to be able to generate all of that information. Okay, so that brings me to the end of, of my talk. I just wanted to see if I can have any questions or discussions. So let me just stop sharing so I can see who's there and what questions we have. Hi, Howard. Um, I think this was very interesting. We do have a couple of questions in the um, chat. Um, and okay. mine was quite early on. Um, I wanted to know, is value proposition the same as return on investment? No. no. So your return on investment is going to be uh, involving all the costs that are incurred to actually deliver the product. Whereas value proposition is really just focusing on what the customer needs. And so you, you have to keep on going in your commercial feasibility study. You can't just say, okay, I've matched the value proposition, now I'm done. You're going to, you know, that one column that I have is, is it lucrative? What is the right cost that we, or what is the right revenue that we have to improve before we can get the ROI? Thank you. Um, a question from Krasan. What key performance indicators or KPIs should we track to measure the success of our value proposition? Okay, so if you remember those, most of those three different ones that Gartner suggested. So if I'm promising you that you're always going to have the platform available and it will be availability. If I'm saying to you that I'm going to understand your requirements and build you a data product that meets your requirements, it's going to be, well, what was the fit that I delivered? When I delivered the data product, did I miss some of the pains and gains that, you, that we agreed on? Am I meeting those pains and gains or have I left something undefined, uh, unknown, and you're still having pain in dealing with my product? So it's very dependent on your value proposition. Yeah, thank you. Um, from Liana, would BAs normally look at uh, marketing techniques, typically in a financial services or banking environment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great question, and I, I have to be honest with you, I didn't look at a value proposition until almost about eight months ago. Um, and the reason I didn't look at it was, first of all, I hadn't really paid much attention to the business architecture value proposition, and I thought, okay, I'll just take it from them. I'll just accept what they have. But then when I looked at some of the value propositions, I found they were weak in some cases. They didn't really deal with the needs of the customer. They didn't deal with my HR customers. So then I said, 
would understand how to better define these things and how to make sure I can measure them for your issues, not at a high level, oh, I need information. You need certain information to deal with at HR level. And that's not the same as a finance person and things like that. So that's where personas and segments came in to help me be a lot more clear as to the value of how to live it. Makes sense. It's more deliberate that way as well. Yes, yes. A last one from Chrisan. Uh, with reference to partnerships, what criteria do you use to identify potential key uh, partners? And how do you plan to leverage data to manage and optimize these partnerships? Well, maybe I could just ask a quick question. The partners that we are talking about, are those the... So I'm not sure exactly which partners we, we're referring to. Those that were referenced when you look at the value proposition canvas, um, yes. all the resources at play. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so basically we're talking about the value, uh, the partners that are going to help us deliver value. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, as an example, when I build a data product, I'm going to need partners basically in the IT thing that are going to support my data platform that will address the, the customer requirements when necessary. Um, now, certainly what I do within data governance programs is we establish metrics for each one of these different knowledge areas, um, and we have to keep on agreeing those metrics with them. And a lot of what I try to do is to say, can you see the value I need to deliver? And this is going to be your role in producing a platform that delivers that value. Are they going to be the right platform costs, the right platform sharing? What are all those different areas that each one can contribute? Even data quality will, will have to deliver value. If the consumer needs data quality at a certain level, um, are you going to be able to deliver it for that? for that requirement and that cost. Okay. Thanks, Howard. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, Lalita, I don't think I've missed no, I think we've gone here. through them all. Um, we've okay. been quite good, I think, considering the limited time that we have with Howard. So thank yes. you, Howard. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Howard. Thank I know much. you've got a border plane. Um, yes. All, <laughs> all attendees, if you have additional questions, anything, please post. We'll monitor up until about um, 8 o'clock. And then if there's anything else, please, um, you can just email us. You'll know where to find us. And we can pass it on to Howard if there's any questions yeah, that are that's okay. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks, Howard. Safe travels thanks, back home. Thanks, thanks so much for your you. insight. Okay. Safe travels.